Thank you. Um, I'm Kirk Bresnicker. I am the chief architect of the Machine Advanced Development Program at Hewlett Packard Labs. Um, my name is Sharad Singhal. I am responsible for a lot of the software and the software stack on the machine. And finally, Andrew Wheeler, I'm Vice President and Deputy Director of Hewlett Packard Labs, and I have execution ownership of the machine research project. So I guess we'll first just uh, talk a little bit about about what we are showing off and talking about uh, in the labs pavilion uh, here at Discover 2016 London. And that's really about um, the turn on and the successful turn on and beginning to scale up our machine advanced development prototype, our memory fabric test bed. Uh, at this point we have uh, everything working microprocessors, memory fabric, memories, photonics, end-to-end. -end. Uh, we just, in the last about 30 days, have gotten those last pieces in, uh, and we're beginning to ramp up that capacity. You know, so up till now, we've been doing simulations, we've been doing emulations, we've been exploring on more conventional platforms, like our large memory Superdome X platform, understanding things like persistent memory in the ProLiant platform, but now we have that first, that first test bed, that first instrument uh, for research and advanced development coming together for uh, at a practical and uh, really interesting scale to begin to understand how we're going to change algorithms, how we're going to change and, and rewrite some pages of uh, the computer science textbooks uh, for this next era of computational uh, information processing. So we'll open it up and see if there's any questions. Otherwise, we can talk a little bit more about what we're doing. What is the end goal of the machine? So the uh, question is, what is the what is the end goal of the the machine? And and for me, um, it's it's uh, an advanced development program. So it's the ability to take researchers from Hewlett Packard Labs and engineer supply chain, um, material science. Uh, and services uh, expertise from across Hewlett Packard Enterprise business units and give them a focusing uh, project. Focus in on understanding what is it going to be like and what should we be doing to uh, continue to have exponential growth in information technology processing to match what we anticipate to be the continued in, uh, exponential growth of information generation, information demand. So how can we keep that happening realizing that some of the technologies that we have been utilizing uh, are hitting a terminal performance uh, benefit. So we think of something like Moore's Law. You know, we've been predicting its end uh, almost since uh, Gordon Moore predicted it in the 70s, uh, but at this point, you know, we're running out of atoms. You know, we are really facing the end of that particular set of physics, and it's not gonna get worse but it's not going to get better. And how do we find that next set of connections the, to make between physical science, information processing, so we can reignite another era of exponential growth uh, in capacity to match that demand? So for me, the machine advanced development program has been that way to bring research, engineering, supply chain, all those elements together and task them with understanding, predicting, and then engaging. You know, we don't develop these things on our own. We're not trying to create a next generation walled garden. We want to create a conversation. How do I pull in the best open source development teams and un have them understand the capabilities of the technologies we're bringing together? How do we create those open standards so that we can have the kind of innovation uh, that has been so successful in the past? Compute, memory, communications, all accelerating as quickly as a individual technology can and then being able to pull those together uh, for purpose very quickly, efficiently, and economically. So for me, that's has been not only about the technologies, but also how we should want to uh, change how we develop systems so we can keep up with that exponential rate of growth. John, you said something about uh, uh, sharing uh, so the question was about, you know, what is our intentions in terms of, of open source and in uh, and open development? And uh, Sherrod, I'll let you talk about our efforts in the open source. So, 
everything we are doing in the machine program, the intent is to open source it. And we are doing that open source well before we would normally do it. So we're not developing software, polishing it, putting it into final form, and then putting it out into open source. Even as we are developing the pieces, we are taking them open, we are inviting people to come join us inside that conversation. And depending on what takes off or depending on where people are interested, we are encouraging participation for, from everybody. But for all of the things that at both at the operating system, at the middleware level, and the example applications we are creating, we are putting out into open source even as we are building them. Yeah, I also wanted to follow on to kind of your question around, you know, in state and, and what do we hope to get out of the program. Um, I think Kirk really kind of teed up from uh, not really an end state, but just you know, kind of that vision of where we think this architecture can go, what kind of influence it can have. Uh, I would say from my standpoint, another thing we're trying to do along the way is a lot of the technologies that have been developed uh, and that we are demonstrating on uh, this proof of concept right now, the idea is we want to get as many of those technologies into our near-term roadmap as possible. So, you know, whether it's advancements, um, you know, around the memory side, the memory fabric, uh, you know, security things, uh, you know, the idea is we want to get those deployed uh, even individually, uh, you know, as kind of innovative proof points, whether it's for the hybrid IT solutions or for the IoT space, uh, that over time that we have kind of this steady stream of innovation that come out of the machine program, that get into our entire product line, and then, you know, ultimately as more and more of those assets come together, uh, you know, we get closer to something, you know, and it, more of an end state that Kirk talks about as far as, you know, kind of a new architecture and bringing these together in scale. So uh, I think that's another really important point is, is again, those assets, technologies that are developed as part of the program, uh, we, we want to see those deployed uh, across our, you know, whether it's server roadmap, networking roadmap, you name it. So this is just separating their research and development here go to market type scenario? Uh, so, yeah, the question is how do we, is this, you know, research and development versus go to market? Uh, like Kirk said, one of the really key things about this program is, is we want this strong tie between research, advanced development, and then actual product implementation. So with what we've demonstrated and what we're doing with uh, what's running with the machine right now, that by in of itself is not an end product. Uh, but the fact that we've worked alongside, you know, our business units, the product groups, uh, that then starts to create that funnel or that pipeline into actual product. How do you position technology speaking your, your, uh, your effort? Because sometimes there are, you know, you can't define your, your, your infrastructure as a general partner, you can try some of this. And uh, so it's for uh, you work. Yeah, so the, the, the question is, um, you know, look, the, the industry is always going to be looking for a way to move forward. And typically the way IT works, uh, even the high performance computing space, I, I would say in general terms, it's all an evolutionary approach, right? You're always looking to, okay, well, you know, bring uh, either more cores to the problem or maybe, you know, next generation a little bit faster interconnect on Ethernet or InfiniBand. Um, and so basically the question is with, with kind of that in mind and everyone trying to move forward just a little bit more, uh, what's different about our approach and maybe what, what sets, uh, sets it apart? Uh, so Kirk, maybe kind of start with that and we'll, we'll add in as necessary. Sure. So I think um, when I look at what we, what we pulled together, uh, what is different about our approach is trying to understand how we treat those memory resources. Uh, how, what kind of capacity should we be, to, uh, uh, um, assuming we should have our memory, and then how do we access it? Um, I think that was sort of the, the initial um, 
you know, the, the, the germ that we, the, the nucleus that we, we grew out from, understanding what is that memory capacity. Um, this, I think, in, in a great deal was informed by our research into, into technologies like Memristor, like Resistive RAM, those next generation memory technologies uh, that could be the, you know, the, the catalyst for that next wave of, of exponential growth. So starting with the memory, putting memory at, at the center, understanding if that's what grows exponentially, um, that's a different kind of computer science environment than we've had the first 50 years. You know, whereas if you go read von Neumann's uh, original EDVAC paper, he said, you know, the key to high performance uh, electronic computation is going to be how efficient and how reliable and the capacity we can have for the memory. Uh, and that's sort of been on that curve all along, that the computational part has gotten faster and better faster than the memory part. And this, a lot of it just has to do with the basic physics, trying to make that large, repeatable memory array efficient, um, durable, all these things that have been somehow a little bit elusive. Now, when we looked at it and said, you know what, we can actually make interesting memory arrays of, of vast capacity by pulling together these memory technologies and then also you know the photonic element how do we have them be energy efficient and scalable up to large sizes um, that change in that basic economics from scarcity of memory to abundance of memory I think was the, the first piece now when you begin to explore that you understand and you begin to understand how you would create the memory fabric technologies another couple pieces sort of fall into position, I think that is different. Uh, and one of them you already mentioned, you know, this diversity of computational devices. You know, when the transistors stop getting smaller, and they've already stopped getting faster, they've already stopped using less power, they've already stopped becoming uh, more reliable. So they've been on, you know, the, the end of Dennard scaling was in 2005, and now we're at the end of Moore's Law scaling. There has to be something more clever to do than just put out another copy of an existing uh, architecture that is well established, well supported, has lots of software written for it. And how do you very quickly pull together those heterogeneous computational devices, that accelerator next to that general purpose uh, processor, and have it be scalable to huge volumes of data? I think that also comes into play. So. The memory on the fabric, the computation on the fabric, um, the scalability of the memory, using photonics to allow us to scale from devices that might be handheld up to room size and have that same programming model throughout. I think that's where we would see ourselves as different. You know, when we talk to the software teams, you know, there's about four vectors that they really find fascinating. One is just the sheer abundance of memory that I can provide them addressable as memory and a latency and an addressable quantum of individual bytes that allow them to code in simple instructions in the microprocessor instruction set and access all that memory. The thing is the well connectedness to put in just the right GPU and have it be right next to the same memory as the general purpose processor, as the accelerator, as the FPGA or DSP. Um, the third is that non-volatility both for changing the, the fault domain and understanding how you get durable results, and also because where memory is non-volatile, I don't have to pay a tax to maintain its contents, an energy tax. And if I want to retain petabytes, exabytes of data, I have to have something that I can afford to keep in perpetuity. And the last piece is that scale, that I have something that can go from something that's handheld to room size and have one programming model, one simple flat address space model that allows me to express an algorithm uh, naively, simply, and have it go from something that's very small all the way to something very large. So I think for me, it's, it's tackling all the issues, looking under all the rocks, from the basis device physics all the way up through new algorithms and analytics. Uh, that's sort of an inclusivity that I don't necessarily see from, uh, from other approaches. I can add to that as an application writer. When I look at what I can do with the system, take for example the storage class memory that people are talking about, and I say because I'm using memory technology, I can build faster storage and I can essentially do block I.O. faster. It turns out that in our applications, uh, we are really good at hiding latency to storage because we have done that for the last 50 years. Um, so at the application level, the gain that you get from something like that is not as high as you might expect. 
profit if I can treat not as high as you might expect. So even though at the storage level I'm making something 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 times faster, the application is not really running that much faster because the bottleneck just shifts to another part of the application. In the new architecture that we are looking at, I have the ability to actually rethink the application differently because all of this persistence is as memory. When I create a variable inside the program, it is persistent and it just stays there. So I don't have to go through that entire stack of translation, reformatting things, putting them onto disk, and redoing all of that computation in the read path. I just create a variable, label it to persistent, and say just stay there, give it handle. Now I can pass that handle around in my distributed processing system, and all of a sudden I'm passing references around rather than copying data over and over again. And at that point, the application suddenly starts becoming totally different in both how it performs and how I rethink about the application. So it's, it's that translation from all of the things Kirk said into how I now view that structure inside my program that makes the difference. Yeah, kind of two two questions there. So the first is around, um, uh, yeah, ag acknowledging kind of the architecture kind of gets it, but what about uh, you know the processor roadmaps and the different vendors out there? You know, how do how do we envision that? And then the second part is, well, are we you know ultimately creating something that's you know proprietary in nature? Uh, so on the the processor side first. Uh, you know, look, our, our vision here is that there's not just one right compute for everything, okay? And that, uh, you know, again, we, we see applications that would say, look, if I need a lot of, you know, integer performance, then yes, I want to bring something that has as many, uh, you know, high frequency cores as possible, a lot of on-chip cache, all of that. If I have something that is very dative or float, floating point intensive, uh, then I want to bring kind of a different mix in. And, you know, the different processor vendors out there, just, just like today, they're still going to be, you know, focused on what they do best. Whether it's, okay, uh, you know, one company that can just manufacture at scale and they're better at manufacturing than anyone else, well, guess what? They're going to continue to bring a lot of cores to the problem, a lot of cash, a lot of integration, whereas other companies are going to focus more on uh, maybe the purpose-built compute, uh, you know, bringing the GPUs in. And then, you know, even, even today we're seeing more and more of the accelerators kind of come into place, whether it's purpose-built computers for or you know, doing neural networks and the training or FPGAs that are highly programmable depending on what the workload is doing. So, you know, in many ways, our architecture, we think, actually benefits the greater ecosystem uh, because if you've got a great processing uh, capability, we, we want to enable a path to, to greater availability for you on that. So a, a big part of this then starts to become, well, what does that memory fabric look like? Um, so, you know, we ourselves have years of developing uh, coherent memory semantic fabrics, okay? We've, we've proven that out, whether it's uh, on the Superdome line or, you know, even recently with the acquisition of SGI, you know, there's a coherent link that's available there. What we envision for this architecture, though, is that memory fabric being completely open. 
and that's where we see something like Gen Z coming into effect. So the Gen Z consortium that was announced a few weeks ago, uh, the idea is that that is a completely open uh, fabric or interconnect that we think can be used for this architecture. So at the end of the day, our vision would be we have multiple endpoints that could be you know, stitched together on this fabric being the processing side or the memory side, and that's how we would want to build out from this. So I would say quite the opposite from you know, anything proprietary. Uh, we want to enable all comers, uh, and we think they have a seat at the table with this architecture. No, I think that, you know, it's been interesting as when, when the internet scaling, when power and frequency scaling, you know, stopped in 2005, you know, we didn't, we didn't stop, right? The transistors kept getting smaller, and what that, the way that we continued uh, to progress was to integrate more and more on single pieces of silicon. And whether this is an enterprise uh, CPU with memory controllers and I.O. controllers integral next to a, a lot of cores, or it's a, a, a microprocessor, an integrated device in a mobile, you know, where you had that SOC with radios and, and, um, and, um, and, uh, multimedia processors all integrated on single silicon, you still got performance gains because you, you took out costs, uh, you took out power by integrating into single pieces of silicon. The challenge with that is that that then fixes the relationship. You can't have each piece evolving on its own uh, accelerated schedule. So if you had a breakthrough memory technology, well guess what, you get to wait until the next round of some other technology like I.O. or like a core processor in order for you to, to slate in. So you have uh, schedules that were pulled back, advanced or retarded because you had to get all these things simultaneously. One of the things that's really, uh, I think, interesting with the memory fabric is that we can have the performance we need to pull together interesting solutions on the fly and still have each piece advancing as quickly as its innovators wanted to, to come to, to market. So you can sort of break up that embrace. You still have the performance you need because it's a memory fabric because we've incorporated everything we need to to make it high performance, um, but it also allows that diversity. It's somewhat ironic. We, we focused on the memory and we opened up for innovation and greater contribution in both ends of the wire. So when you bring something to market, uh, does that go outside your board now, or is that going to slow down the entire process uh, of the development of the machine? So if you, if, you, if you to pick a part of the machine and bring it to market, are you, you then now responsible to maintain that for market capabilities? Or does that go to a different org inside of HP to, to run that so you can continue to develop on its own? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the question was, um, as far as the team that's doing the uh, machine demonstration, are we then ultimately re responsible for taking some of that those technologies to product and then supporting those over time? Uh, so I think, you know, one of the really great things about this program and what we've been able to do is by combining kind of research capability and talent with engineering expertise that are embedded directly in the product teams, uh, the hope and the intent and what we, we start to see happening right now is that there's there's already a um, natural transfer that's ready ready to go. So in fact, a lot of the photonics demonstrations that we have out on the floor today is a great example of that. Uh, at this time last year, we had uh, some of the photonic demonstrations actually in the research labs area. And now what, what we see there is there are still some demonstrations, but they're on kind of the next generation of photonics and where you will actually find what is kind of product ready and what it will go into product uh, soon is actually in the product showcase. So uh, I just I just vectored a, a customer that direction so you can write down uh, pillar S6, okay? That's where that particular demonstration of the photonics capability is. Uh, but that is exactly the idea is that, you know, we don't have the, a lot of our researchers, they don't have kind of that in product responsibility, uh, probably nor the final expertise for what it takes to, you know, manufacture something at scale or support it. But that's where the business unit uh, research and development groups they have that expertise, and since they've been working right alongside us in many of these areas, it's just you know 
it's a, essentially a seamless transition now to get that into product and they've already you know established the vendor relationships and the supply chain relationships and uh, you know if there's software that goes with it both uh, at the embedded level or the application level all of that's being developed kind of you know as we've moved along uh, such that there's really no interruption as far as getting this into the product roadmaps. So that was the goal when we uh, set on this a couple of years ago, and uh, we're seeing really good examples of how that's moving forward, uh, both on the persistent memory and the photonics. Those are probably the two near-term examples of that. Can you compare and contrast this to uh, Intel's vision for NVMe and 3D Crosspoint? <laughs> I know you're working some of the same things there, so. Yeah, so question, compare and contrast. I think you were loud enough, probably everyone heard, uh, to kind of Intel's approach with NVMe and 3D Crosspoint. Uh, Kirk, why don't you start with that, and I'll, I'll chip in as needed. So um, in terms of NVMe, um, it's still it's still out there on PCI Express. So it's still memory devices, but they are on the other side of a PCI Express root complex. I'm still going through that that complex. Also, they are still you know centered around you know what can I attach to to this microprocessor inside of you know inside of this either this blade or the server, and I can still use conventional technologies to cluster them up whether it's OmniPath or InfiniBand or Ethernet. I'm still having that same model. I have resources that are directly attached to a processor, and then I go through an I/O regime uh, to share beyond the confines of that individual um, individual. Uh, instance. Uh, what we are doing is, you know, taking memory resources, you know, you know, emancipating the mic, putting them onto a shared fabric, uh, and then either I can either do it um, uh, serially or simultaneously, allowing multiple computational resources to share and to uh, interact with those with those pooled resources, with those pooled memories. So, memory on a fabric computation on, as a peer on that fabric and then heterogeneous computation on that fabric. I think that's where I would I would contrast it uh, to things like NVMe. You know, if I'm still on NVMe, I'm still going through the root complex. I'm not putting memory devices as peers with computation on a purpose-built memory fabric. I thought that NVMe-only fabrics would allow you to, uh, to do memory to memory uh, transfers, not I.O. type transfers. And, 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 in, in addition to I.O. transfers. And in doing that, though, I'm still I'm still utilizing that infrastructure. So I'm still going through that circuitry. So the question is, you know, can I, if I look at them perhaps abstractly from the software point of view, you say, well, it's doing similar things. I'm going through similar motions. The question is, what is what is the um, what is the latency? You know, what does that path look like? And is it look different enough for me to change my approach? And I think that's really what, what Sheridan and his team have seen is capacity at latency that causes me to say, you know what? I was using this algorithm, it's well proven, it's well understood. I'm gonna I'm gonna adapt my algorithm or I'm gonna I'm gonna create a new one because you have given me new constraints, new things I will optimize against. You know, for me, computer science is, is a science of optimizing against constraints. It's a practical science. Um, and for, the, for what we're doing here, we're, we're changing some of those basic economics, causing them to, to really reevaluate their approach to a problem. And now I'll, I'll hit the um, 3D cross point. That's kind of the second part of your question as well. So with 3D cross point, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, you know, we see this across the industry, not just with with Intel and Micron, but it's really a validation of our architecture. So, you know, what we're talking about, the advantages of, you know, uh, applications accessing things in a memory semantic way versus a block I.O. Okay, great. Everyone's kind of on board with that now. Uh, and with 3D Crosspoint, our approach is, even while we have a deep co collaboration with uh, Western Digital developing, you know, a, a next generation memory technology. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of open to all comers when it comes to memory technology. So if, if 3D Crosspoint hits the market first and it has attributes that are interesting to us and can help move the architecture along, you know, we're, we're all ears and arms wide open for that. 
you know, one of the challenges, though, we, we do see with it, is, as Kirk was talking about earlier, um, you know, even if we can access it in a, in a memory semantic way, will it still fix to the processor? I still have a fixed interface into the CPU, and so I have to, you know, still kind of use it in, in traditional ways. It, it gets us a little further down the road in terms of what can be done with persistent memory, but it doesn't fully, you know, unlock the capability. And so if there is a way for us to use that technology, use it on uh, our memory semantic fabric, hey, we, we want to take advantage of it, no doubt about it. I mean, that's an interesting thing, though, because Intel, Intel has a vested interest in that couple. They, they, they want uh, they want this direction in computing to use their chips and uh, so so the question is do you think then that that this is a uh, threat to them I mean you obviously have to partner with them you can't do this without them can you do it with them yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, so is this a threat to Intel anyway? How do we partner with them? Uh, you know, I think quite the opposite. I, I don't, uh, you know, at the end of the day, and, you know, I can't obviously speak directly for Intel strategy, but, you know, knowing what's publicly available and having worked closely with them at the engineering level for many years, you know, at the end of the day, they want to sell processors, okay? Uh, and there are different ways that uh, we can partner with them uh, in order to take advantage of the technologies and in the, in the chip that they have available. So, you know, ultimately, would uh, you know, would we like to see them, you know, join the Gen Z consortium and and do that and you know, kind of natively integrate some things. You know, absolutely. Uh, but even if they don't do that, there are still ways that uh, we will make use of every every different type of processor technology they have, whether it's the, the general purpose high core count or the mini core initiative with, uh, you know, some of the things they do for the HPC space or, you know, if whatever they have in terms of processing capability, we will certainly find a way to, uh, to use it in the architecture. So some of those ways are more performant than others. Um, and at the end of the day, we would like to take latency and cost out of the solutions. Uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, make no mistake about it. We think there's plenty of opportunity here for Intel. and we, we see no reason why we can't make full use of everything that they, they produce. Yeah, as you talk about this new memory semantics and network memory architecture, uh, it, it kind of reminds me of uh, just talking about some folks with DACA, okay? And you can do some simple things with containers, but in order to really use containers, you have to redesign your service as a cloud-native set of services. And this strikes me very smoothly that you have to re-architect, um, I guess, what it means to be an operating system So I think uh, one of the things that's, uh, that's definitely uh, that we've demonstrated already is um, we can build bridges. Is that you know if you want to see this pool of memory and you really want to see a POSIX file system on top of it because that's what you understand, we can do that. If you want to see a TCP IP stack uh, instead of seeing direct sharing of, of variables as Chair described, we can do that. Um, if you want to see a library that's uh, accessible to a C++ or a, a Java enterprise programmer and offers persistence as a capability that you can in, add in uh, with some simple library calls, we can we can do those bridge, bridges. Um, I think, but to get the greatest benefit. I think that's where you want to understand, um, and it's not just not, not just a new implementation. I think the, that's sort of that middle step. You know, so the first step is just adapt uh, existing interfaces and existing APIs to the underlying structure. The second is to is to re-implement existing algorithms. I think where you see the greatest breakthrough potential is where people say, you know what, uh, I'm going to design an entirely new algorithm because you've changed the basic basic economics against which uh, I designed an algorithm. So I'll go back to you know, Nuth and uh, re-look at some of those things and say, you know what, we took this beautiful, simple algorithm and then we made it complicated because we had a high latency or we had to deal with the discrepancy between uh, CPU performance, memory performance, and disk performance. 
now that we've rechanged all of those relationships, um, it's time to re-examine and, and create some new algorithms. But the, the, those relationships are now 70 years old, right? <laughs> so it's going to take some work. It does, but uh, I think we have, uh, and you should, you should talk to this, but we have proof points. We have teams that have, in just a matter of you know three or so years, um, and using conventional systems to start with, uh, like, like the Superdome platforms, uh, large memory capacity on a fabric. We designed it for high performance uh, transaction processing, but if you ignore the fact that it's coherent, it is you know a 300 nanosecond, 24 terabyte, 16 socket, top of the line Xeon E7 beast. Uh, that you can use as you know that first generation of a memory fabric system, and those teams have been successful at unlearning and then and learning anew. I think yeah, I think maybe uh, sure maybe walk through you on the smart example. So the I mean what Kurt was finishing with was that over the last 50, 60 years, all of us have learned how to program a certain way. And that's because that's how things were actually optimized. What we found in our own work was that um, the answer in retrospect seems obvious, but the teams had to unlearn what they learned to how to make systems work. And that, I think that's the, you know, that's the mental shift that you're talking about, which is that we just know how this thing is done, right? And once I have done it over and over and over again, and somebody comes, you know what, this is not going to work or it's not going to do the best you can. It's a huge hurdle mentally to say, I have to do it a different way and maybe the best way I'm used to doing is not the right way. So we started with Spark and we said, that's the best in-memory analytics things. We are talking about big data, we are talking about in-memory analytics is the obvious thing to try and improve. The first examples that the team did was, well, let's let's move everything into in-memory environments and see what happens. It turns out that we did not see the exam the uh, gains we were expecting, and that was what I was talking about earlier. You see gains, but they're on the order of two x, and nobody's going to move to an architecture for two x, right? Um, then the teams drilled down further and saw what was happening. It's it's because the entire platform architecture has built into it assumptions about how what's underneath. And they are deep assumptions, and you have to rethink those things. Once the teams got in there and started making changes at that level, we got to 15x performance improvement. And then there were other parts of the teams which were looking at, well, I don't want to think about it. Let me take this architecture. How would I write an, an application in this environment? Um, they made changes. They were seeing two orders of magnitude. The last thing we were showing this time, which is new from last Discover, if you were there, um, is people are doing financial simulations, risk management kinds of things. And there they said, OK, I get it, and I'm going to rethink my entire application. They're saying now three orders of magnitude improvement over what, how they were doing it before. So I think this is a gradual learning process and a, a gradual process of adapting applications to this environment. Depending on what the needs are, some people will say, I'm perfectly happy running my old code at 2x. I'm great with that. I'll stay with that because the effort to rethink it is too high. For other parts of the system, people will say, you know what? If I can get three times, three orders of magnitude improvement in my application, I'm willing to take the pen. How, how much of it is that? I mean, it's, I mean, the simple answer is running OpenStack and Docker container, which doesn't yeah. like much, right? Yeah. So that's your first step, right? That's right. Right, so it, and, and we have gone through that process, and we're making all of the learnings we are doing available as part of open source things. So people have examples, but again, my my real answer is, I don't think we have scratched the surface. I mean, we are a handful of people who are doing this. As we move forward in this path, other people will think of creative ways to use this system and creative ways of using this architecture. So we have we have a lot more to learn here. Andrew, you had something to add? No, that was good. I mean, yeah, we just want to discuss today of our own experience going through, through that learning curve. Existence proof. I like those. <laughs> With so much, we're talking about 50, 60 years of the legacy, right? With so much security concerns of being fundamental memory issues, either reading memory you shouldn't or executing memory you shouldn't, what type of intrinsic protections are you guys building in? 
So um, the first level is understanding if all memory is persistent, and you know, that's, that, that's not where we are yet. Um, all data is always at rest. That means all data needs to be protected all the time. If I can put a terabyte into my shirt pocket and walk out of it, it I better not be useful to anyone anymore uh, if I've stolen, you know, physically stolen that. So, so understanding what is the efficient uh, and uh, uh, successful or proper level of cryptographic protection that I want to put into the memory devices and understanding that. I think also understanding the, the memory fabric. And uh, you know, this is this was a kind of a unique opportunity for us. We're starting from from scratch, uh, and you know, our participation in, in things like the Gen Z consortium has been in, been informed uh, by the research and advancement of what we've done. And one of the things that it gave us an opportunity to is when we had just the very beginnings of what should a memory semantic fabric look like, we had the team, actually the team from here in Bristol, at Hewlett Packard Labs in Bristol, and they gave it the full audit. You know, so they you know, brought 21st century understanding of advanced persistent threats, and it was there. It wasn't bolted on. It was really part of the discussion from the very beginning. You know, so much of sort of the the you know, the dark side of, of Moore's law being this constant um, tailwind that's that's been propelling us forward with with increased uh, efficiencies, is that it's sometimes. Uh, economically infeasible to go back and look at some things that you know were perfectly acceptable when Kearney and, uh, Rich, uh, Kearney and Ritchie were at Bell Labs designing Unix with a root user, designing C with a naked pointer, um, and doing these things because for them physical security was adequate security, and they had isolated air gap systems because that's all that they had. You know, those are not the kind of systems we have today. So this has been an opportunity for us to go back. Uh, and as we're doing new elements, to make sure that those cybersecurity professionals are there at the table. And sometimes it's the first time they've had that invitation. Now, as I think we had some comments earlier on, you know, if you're using a conventional microprocessor, well, you have memory paging and security are all bound in with virtual memory. And here I am offering more physical memory than we can address in virtual memory. So there's going to be a, a process by which we will introduce some new concepts, new technologies. Uh, some of the things we're doing research um, on are um, technologies really that are, are, some of them are from the mainframe. The capabilities kinds of security work that's being researched out of the University of Cambridge. Um, these are opportunities for us to evaluate these technologies, see what would it take to, to pull this in? What is the operating system work? What is the microprocessor, microarchitecture work? Is the fabric ready for this? Have we put the right features into the memory devices as we work in the consortium to define these standards? Looking forward to these uh, much more modern, much more integrated uh, security features, and, and how quickly can we push them out? Yeah, one of the really nice things about uh, the test bed that we've developed is, you know, other than probably the, you know, the processor itself, everything else, uh, you know, we've prototyped with, with FPGAs as far as the memory fabric implementation. And this really, from a security standpoint, really allows us to now fine tune and do a lot of what if around, okay, if I'm protecting, you know, data in transit, you know, what, what are those algorithms look like? Uh, if I'm protecting data at rest, okay, what's my key management solution? How does that work? So this is, this test but it really does now give us that opportunity uh, to think about security from that level and uh, you know not just think about it from well it's a, it's an OS domain or something else uh, you know even the firewalling and okay now that I have this persistent memory pool uh, you know how do I ensure that you know only the right people have access if I'm you know sharing a particular region of memory so uh, it allows us at the hardware level to really you know kind of fine-tune and uh, you know really Really understand and explore a lot of the security operations available to us from the broader research community. How would you describe where you are on this journey that you're on? It sounds like there are, you know, you, you, you've thought about a lot of stuff, you're still discovering things as you go. As new people get involved and bring new things to it that are, you know, are, are impacting it. Uh, so where are you at? Yeah, so, so where are we on, on the journey? Um, like I said, I think 
I think demonstrating the test bed and getting the test bed up and running represents uh, it's a it's a huge milestone for us because now it goes from you know kind of the theater theoretical or uh, uh, designed by PowerPoint as we call it uh, to something now that a broader set of software developers can and and researchers can start to take advantage of and really uh, now have something because there's always a chicken and egg problem right uh, so that's that's kind of one point and then uh, you know another point is again whether it's with the photonics or the the memory side of things we really do now see an accelerated path in the product for some of those point technologies and point improvements but I think by having the test bed even though it's it's at small scale now we have the ability to scale it to the levels that I think are much you know much more interesting uh, so I you know as far as that journey goes that I think is a really big step function for us uh, from the software development the analytics the applications and what's possible uh, to be able to scale from you know a handful of nodes that we have working together now to even larger systems and uh, you know larger interconnects this start to really ring out more of the architecture and allow us to to get that into to products even sooner I don't know Kirk or Sherry you may probably have your own perception of what it means so I think until now at least at the application level um, we were rethinking algorithms and then running them on traditional architectures and we were seeing enormous performance gains there at this point in time the next step for us at the application level is to validate all of the things that we were doing on traditional architectures on the real thing and measure the things and again satisfy ourselves constantly that we are not doing wishful thinking. I mean, it has to measure up to what we think it has to be. And the test bed now gives me the ability to do those kinds of experiments on the real hardware instead of just emulation inside the environment. Side by side, like as Andrew said, there are components which will go into product roadmaps and that's a, that's a constant flow of information and components from where we are. And the next set of things I think we need to think through now is we are constantly in this environment talking about a scale up environment. Uh, how much can I do? How much can I make bigger? There is also a thread side by side that we are watching, which is can I scale the system down and bring it into the IoT environment? And what does it what does it imply in terms of building smaller components which have the same architectural features? And what can we do at that scale? That's an open question right now. I think we have to explore it. So I think uh, for me the fascinating thing is is you achieve you, you we set out to, to demonstrate. You know there is a new performance curve. And at first it was the question, but by simulation and emulation, can you can you say well, yeah it looks like it? And now by direct measurement we're saying okay now here's how I'm going to plot out these points in the curve. Uh, and as a reward you get to tackle an even more challenging problem, which is okay you've demonstrated you've created a, a scientific instrument. Now how do you turn that into not just a, a, a system uh, that we can deliver, but an entire supply chain and an ecosystem? And how do you, you know, it has to be bigger than us. And how do you strike that balance between what we want to achieve and what we can do and what we want to enable so that we can achieve things greater together? So uh, we move beyond just the, uh, the uh, basic, uh, the basic uh, business, uh, business school class to some of the more advanced topics of how do you really transform not just our intent, but the direction of many, many different parties? And how do you engage open source development communities? How do we engage industry consortiums? How do you steer this? Uh, uh, you know, at, at one order of, of abstraction away. So, uh, certainly, it's, uh, it's it's fascinating to see that success gets you invited to even more challenging problems. That kind of brings up the, the question of system robustness. Right? As you grow that ecosystem, I, I, I can only imagine plug fests. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to actually connect new capabilities and hardware capabilities. Right? This is all about like such. Yeah. How how do you adjust that? So I think that is uh, where we have uh, a lot of experience in doing those. Um, you know, 
uh, things like uh, you know having people that I know we've worked with who shepherded some of the uh, UEFI plug fests, where you know it was let's all get together in a hotel in Taiwan. Everyone, bring, you bring your cards. I'll bring my my firmware. We'll bring some other people. Bring the the systems, and we'll hack it out. And it's like you, it's part of the part of the entrance requirements are don't just send someone who, who can plug things in, someone who can who can check in, who can make modifications, who can do these things on the fly, uh, and really, you know, participate wholeheartedly. And so I think we do have great success models of industry consortiums that can very quickly prove out, um, prove out that by really driving that plug fest and hackathon mentality. I think that's the kind of energy that you want to harness. Um, of course, the first thing is, is to get a specification out there that we all agree on, and that's uh, that is the work in progress of that of that group now, and that's where you know all the things that we've been learning are informing our contributions into that uh, process uh, across the industry. So I think that um, I think there's there's two pieces of it. Um, one piece is uh, you know can I actually get you know how quickly can I get some capacity of, of non-volatile memory uh, and which has not just the capacity I want but also has that energy profile I want that has the durability that I want those characteristics. So there's that piece of it, and then marry that up with just the right amount of, of, of just the right amount of computation and the right style of computation, and create that smallish node. Uh, but I actually think that there's a couple steps that are interesting before that, and then actually our our friends right out here, uh, the uh, Aruba team, is we've been having conversations with them. And a piece before you talk about just like that miniature sensor uh, deep memory pool at the edge is understanding how do we push analytics out towards that edge. Um, if we imagine you know, that the world of Tokyo Olympics in 2020, where there's 8 billion people and carrying 20 billion mobile devices, interacting with 100 billion smart things, everything from a thermostat to a self-driving car, um, the 40 zettabytes of data that the world will have created by that point, I imagine that most of it will actually live out in that edge because we won't have the bandwidth and the latency and the capability of transmitting it back to a centralized location to be analyzed and then send actions back. We have to understand how do we begin to push that analytics out towards the edge? So that's where um, products that we're, we're working on now, like our edge line systems, you know, creating that integrated, um, uh, hardened uh, edge device that you can begin to understand what is it like to push analytics out for the the interaction of mesh devices at the edge to create that intelligent edge and understand how will that affect things so I actually see that as that first step uh, in cyber internally sometimes we call that thing one yeah. there's thing one and there's thing two thing one is how do I push analytics out to the edge and have the edge work um, intelligently and then the second thing is okay farther out as we have more maturity in the memory technologies and the silicon technologies then we'll have that thing too which is that miniaturized version deep pool of memory just the right computation high performance computer, uh, communication uh, and also applications and operating environments designed around non-volatility not because we only because we want to have uh, the storage of the information but we also want to move to an environment where the computation is is almost always off that we wake up instantly uh, from a from a zero energy state to make the measurement to record the data to do the analytics and then go back just as quickly to zero energy use so I think there's a multi-step process intelligent edge out to that intelligent sensor so my question was kind of in the skies. Um, I was actually wanting to know how far out you thought you could actually take this product. And so obviously the IoT is going to be an endpoint for this type of person there. I just kind of understand. It. And you answered what I wanted. It was your journey to get to that point. Yeah, so for me it's, it's a spectrum. You know, I think of what, what are we really great at? And it is that intelligent edge and then that hybrid IT data center. And I don't see those as a dichotomy. I see them as a continuum that I see them working together, that we have that huge edge with the vast majority of the world's information will be held out there, and I want to be able to analyze it in place so that I can have 
actions. If I want to do a 5G communication system, I can't tolerate the latency it takes to get back to the central office. I may have to make decisions about the radios, about the data, about the networking, all the way out the edge, and it can't just be one sensor. It has to be that whole network working together. So understanding how that then informs, though, and provides rich data uh, to hold in perpetuity at the center and have those business de uh, decisions driven from that wealth of analyzed information. So I do see them as, as a whole spectrum. Yeah, just to follow on, I think that was a really good answer, Kurt. I, I think that is you know, part of our perspective on the journey and especially, especially the IoT space, that I think it is it is far different than than most of the other players in the IoT space. Uh, you know, they're either focused on kind of the, the sensor streaming piece of it or the, hey, just, you know, the data aggregator, send me all your data and then trust me, I'll do great things with it and monetize it, you know, for you. Uh, so I think this, this perspective of, of analytics at the edge and, you know, bringing kind of the right compute to that environment, uh, you know, I think also speaks to one of the earlier questions, which is, again, provides ample opportunity for, you know, processing capability that is most effective for that space, and there's not a one-size-fits-all. So, um, yeah, in terms of that kind of continuum for how we think this architecture scales, uh, I think that's a really good good example of all the way from the IoT edge up to that data center scale is, is really, we see we think there's relevance, uh, you know, all along the way. I, great questions, by the way. Thank you very much.